I'll take the uh, protein question, uh, since that's been kind of my area of interest. Um, so how much protein do we need? Well, the RDA did a series of studies and reviews of these over many, many years, which I catalog in my book. Um, they came up using nitrogen utilization studies, so you measure how much nitrogen you take in, how much nitrogen you put out, to kind of come up with an idea of how much nitrogen we need. And then you then build a normal curve. You know what a normal curve is, right? So some people needed a certain amount, other people's needed a certain amount. They wanted to make sure that people got, before they give a recommended daily allowance, they want to make sure that enough people got all the protein that they needed uh, in order to get proper utilization and not get what's called catabolic, where you're breaking down protein. And so they recommended roughly 56 grams for an adult male, 46 for a female. Now you gotta remember, that's two standard deviations above the normal, because they wanted to make sure they got everybody or over 90% of the population. So probably we need less than that, less than those recommendations, but to be safe, those are the, not, those are not the minimum you need. That's the be safe, we got you covered. 56 grams for a male, 46 grams for a female. MIT kind of came out with a study saying that wasn't an effective way at looking at this, and they looked at something called uh, uh, muscle protein stimulation studies using uh, radioactive labeled amino acids and that utilization, and that brought the number up a bit, though they never provided much study showing that we were deficient at those levels. In fact, people, eat way more than that 56 grams for a male and 46 grams for a female. Depending on whether you look at the NHANES data or, or what you're looking at, it's 70 to 100, sometimes 120. Bodybuilders are going for 180 over that 56 grams. And the muscle protein studies are basically get us that formula usually here, which is 0.8 grams per kilogram lean body mass, not your weight, but what your lean fat-free mass is. Um, people have ex now say 0.8 per pound or 0.8 per uh, total weight, which is inaccurate. So people are way overeating both the RDA's recommendations and even the, the, the further studies. If you're exercising, yes, you need more. How much? Oh my God, there's about 10 million studies on this and a lot of, of argument. In the exercise physiology world, they're saying between 1.8 and 2.2 seems to be the same. There's no difference. There's some studies saying 1.6 grams per kilogram lean body mass. There's a lot at 1.2. I will tell you, if you're an Olympic athlete and you're trying to get that 0.5 seconds in order to get the gold, maybe you need slightly more. But when you look at the studies showing the increased protein and not look at muscle protein synthesis, but rather look at actual muscle size or actual weight lifted, it makes such a minuscule difference that I don't know why you would take on the risk of higher protein for that tiny little minuscule difference. So typically, I go with, if you're an athlete, 1.2 grams per kilogram lean body mass, not your weight. If you're a regular person going about your day, walking normally, I like the RDA and I think it works well. As far as can you get enough on a plant-based protein, is that enough? Obviously it's enough. There's uh, very good studies on long-term vegans, as we've talked about, showing that they actually live longer. And unless you're getting, the only studies I've seen with protein deficiency have all been Kenyan studies and things like that, where you're living with people at subsistence, eating nothing but cereal, barely getting their protein, and if they do, they're getting it basically with low calories too. In my practice, and I don't know if any pra anybody's seen, Anybody suffering from low protein that wasn't low calories? Has anybody ever seen that before? I, I, I just haven't seen it, so. Oh, and as far, as far as children are concerned, they can certainly do it too. The only thing I caution with children is you gotta make sure the children are eating a varied diet. Protein is very important, you do need protein. It's so important, it happens to be in just about everything we eat. So you can get it with plants, but you gotta make sure that they are getting the more plant concentrated proteins such as legumes. So if you've got a kid who doesn't want to eat legumes at all and doesn't want to eat any nuts at all, well, you've got a little bit of an issue where you do need to make sure they're getting enough protein. Mm -hmm. What's that? <laughs> you, <laughs> yeah, you can't do that, yeah. Um, You're not going to bed until you eat your I'm not lentils. Yeah. <laughs> Hit the button. Hit the button. Um, I'll just continue on the protein con conversation because I, I have, I, I completely agree with, with everything you said, uh, but I, I would simply add that um, 
that I, I have seen a couple of instances where people aren't getting quite enough protein. And so one is in teenagers who often are become uh, um, very passionate about animal rights and, and the environment, which is a wonderful thing, uh, but they kind of do a switch from eating burgers and fries and Coke to just eating the fries and Coke. And, uh, and so they're eating an awful lot of sugar and an awful lot of fat. And on some occasions, I've seen some getting 20 to 30 grams of protein a day. And for a growing teenager, that's not enough. So they need to add in uh, more concentrated protein sources, such as legumes and tofu and, and things like that, nuts and seeds and so forth. Um, the second group, of course, we know about people not getting enough calories, like people with eating disorders. But the other group that, that, that may not get enough protein are people that are eating pretty much exclusively fruit. Uh, and some fruits have very uh, low uh, protein concentration. So on average, people probably need you know, around 10% of calories from protein. Uh, depending on the person, uh, but many fruits are much lower than that, so it's possible uh, in that situation. And I've seen it uh, on a number of occasions, people doing a raw diet uh, where it's, it's mainly um, fruits, some vegetables, and a lot of oils. <laughs> and in that case, they, they need to add uh, more nuts and seeds. They may need to add some sprouted lentils and things like that. Brenda, so, what was their phenotypic presentation? I mean, how are you, present, how are you diagnosing them with protein deficiency? Uh, so, so what we often see in, in, the, in the raw food folks, I mean, in children, sometimes you just see them not, not right. thriving as they should. Right. But in, uh, in um, the other folks, uh, we see hair loss. Uh, and, and this is really quite common in the raw world where, where people really start losing a lot of hair. Uh, their nails uh, aren't growing well or they, they have problems with them. They have problems, skin problems. Their skin almost looks thin and, and weak. And, and so uh, we have to remember that protein is, uh, uh, and we see bone loss. And I know that that is a, a bit of a controversial subject, but of course protein is necessary for building the matrix of bones. And so you can be too low. And in fact, there was an Adventist Health Health Study 2 study looking at 65,000 women that found that those uh, eating um, a few legumes had a much higher rate of risk fracture than those eating uh, more legumes and getting more protein in their diet. So there is a, a sort of a level at which below you don't want to go too much below. And um, so I've, I've seen, working with raw food people, I, I have seen that. And when we add a little protein to the diet, they, they, they tend to um, overcome some of these issues. I, I want to, Joel, before you take on another question, uh, two references to add to this protein discussion and one anecdote. One of the references is by Christopher Gardner at Stanford University. Really nice report, advances in nutrition, uh, about a year ago, making perfectly clear that all plants contain all of the essential amino yes. acids. That, that's, that's just sort of been a myth in nutrition for a very long time. We followed that up working together with others and wrote a paper arguing for a modernization of the definition of protein quality because we talk about the quality of protein independently of the quality of the food and that misleads people. And so the idea that meat is high quality protein, if you look at the concentration of amino acids, but if the meat is going to make you more prone to death and disease and not do any favors, the food is not high quality. And if you can get all those same proteins, the levels you need from plants that are actually good for you and good for the planet and all of that, that's a higher quality source of protein. The anecdote, just very quickly, is last night uh, before my panel, I wanted to get something to eat in the lobby and they had a quinoa salad at this little uh, atrium restaurant out here. I said, okay, well, that, that looks okay. And the, uh, the server asked me, uh, would you like protein with that? I said, actually, that is my least quinoa, favorite question. Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, quinoa is a, a pretty good source of protein, actually. Yeah. And she said, really? <laughs> yeah. So 
that, that the quinoa was the source of protein. That Gardner was pretty interesting <laughs> at ACLM. He went through his diet and looked, and he actually went and looked at it. Did he have any, because he was eating a plant-based diet, did he have any amino acid deficiencies? And he couldn't find that he had a single amino acid deficiency. But the, the meat-based industry is starting to jump on this terminology of protein quality. Assuming that having higher leucine is therefore good for you, but we know that higher leucine increases IGF-1 and stimulates mTOR, which leads to uh, possible cancer and aging. And so having more of a certain amino acid is not necessarily better.